everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, we're bad, and we're back with another Fact Friday, Frequently Asked Questions Friday. So we like to do our guitar of the week, and this one is the Elegante. It is from a guitar builder in Carlsbad in California, which is about two hours away from us. We went to Summer Nam a couple of years ago before the, uh, the old damn panic, and um, met up with the lovely fellows over there and I played their guitars and they're absolutely phenomenal. What I like about this is it, it sort of slightly echoes Jazz Masters and Jaguars a little bit in as much as it reminds me of like a surf guitar or just something left of center and cool. But the reality is, is it's so much more than that because firstly, it's a player's guitar. It's got a, you know, a, a, quite a flat radius, just a slight curve on it, meaning you can... You can get bends because they're not going to choke with the radius, you know, being a little bit too curved. It's super slinky if you want to. It's a gorgeous playing and gorgeous sounding guitar. Now they do other guitars based much closer to, you know, Telecasters and Strats. There'll be a link below, go and check them out. This is not a paid endorsement. This is just an endorsement of a guitar that we love and that we use all the time. So huge fan, plays absolutely gorgeous and uh, really, really well set up and just everything about it. Absolutely love it. It's beautiful. Work of art. I love it. Don't you love it when craftsmen just get let loose and produce beautiful instruments? And what a guitar to have on stage. Imagine how this would look under lights. Really, really cool. So that's it, the iconic guitars, Elegante. So let's get stuck into some frequently asked questions. So this first one is, well, just a big one. I could just say yes for the answer, but the question is, is it truly possible to mix a radio rock hit 100% in the box? Yes. Next. No, it, it really is. And so many mixers now are entirely 100% in the box. It used to be maybe 10 years ago, it was maybe 60, 40 towards console mixing over in the box mixing. Now I would say it's not even 60, 40 towards in the box. I think it's, I don't know, maybe 80, 90% of what you hear is mixed in the box these days, especially on commercial, like heavy rock, and rock stuff is rarely mixed on consoles, especially as a younger generation is now coming in and dominating, you know, radio, quite frankly. Most of the names that we knew from maybe the mid 90s to the early 2000s aren't mixing big modern rock records. Increasingly, producers, engineers, and mixers are the same person. One of the things that, um, for me, when I first got started, was the barrier to entry because of the gear. I mean, having access to the gear. You go into a room with an incredibly famous producer or engineer or mixer, and it was all about the budget that was there to go into that room and be with the SSL and all the outboard. And what DAWs did is they leveled the playing field. 
And now it's all about your ear and less about the gear. You know, there's a reality of, you know, when you made a record on a four track, doesn't matter how good you were of the mixer, it still would sound like a four track cassette. There was noise, there was an inherent issue. You can never get it that loud, you can never get it that powerful. But if you mixed it on an SSL off of 24 track, it was always gonna sound bigger and fatter. So that barrier to entry was so high that only a very small echelon of producers, engineers, and mixers got to use incredible equipment. Now, God bless DAWs, that barrier to entry has lowered so much. And then bring into the fact that current producers, engineers, and mixers are recording into DAWs. A lot of them are using really great outboard to capture the sounds they want, but when they come to mix, they're using headphones, they're mixing in the box, the plugins are insane, the choices we have now. If they want to have old gear, they can use emulations but they may have already recorded it the way in they want to hear it. So the mixing process is really just that. It's just panning and, and gentle amounts of compression and EQ. But if they want it to be loud and big and slamming, God, the wonderful thing about digital is we can use, you know, limiters to bring things up. We've got multiband compressors, we've got dynamics, EQs, we've got all kinds of things. So no matter what your genre is, mixing in the box can work for you. Don't get me wrong. I love coming out on my SSL, I absolutely love it, but it has a sound which I love. But if I'm competing against something on modern rock radio, I will think very seriously about mixing it entirely in the box because I want it to sound loud and slamming. And for me, when I think about guys like Mark Endert, who were the ultimate SSL mixer as far as I'm concerned. He used to mix on a 9K or a 9J, 72 channels, moving faders. The guy would spend one or two days on a mix, not the 20 minute mixes that we're used to hearing about with the top guys. This guy would spend one to two days and the detail in his mixes was insane, still is insane. You go in and you see little tiny fader moves and it was just beautiful, nothing. You could never hear the compression, but things were always big and fat and loud. I loved his mixes. Then he moved to Florida and flew the console out, reinstalled the console in Florida. Then he started mixing in a summing way. And so he built like summing amps and he went back and rejiggled all of his work so that he could use SSL style plugins to emulate it, going through the summing amp. And then he said to me one day, I can't remember if it was, he was forced to or whatever, but the situation was is that he didn't mix through the summing amps. And he realized that even without those line amps, he could get the results that he wanted. And when I see a guy like Mark Ender, who's a true artist as a mixer, and I see that he's mixing entirely in the box now, my hat's off to him and it basically says, yes, it's possible. Not only is it possible, but when guys at that level are mixing in the box, you know it's a reality and the argument's gone. Now, when it comes down to like analog versus digital kinds of methodology, i.e. breaking out through all the analog equipment or just staying entirely digital, the conversation is less about like what sounds better or what is better in the mix. The conversation is this, it's as simple as this. What do you prefer? What, what do your ears prefer? What does your, what do your hands prefer? Do you like tactile pieces of equipment? Do you like to reach over and boost and cut stuff? Do you have a, um, you know, a love for outboard equipment? Are you happy with all the emulations of that stuff or whatever it might be inside of the box? The reality is mixes can be done at the highest possible level inside of the computer these days, inside of your DAW. And so much that you hear on the radio never ever went out to any outboard at all. And it's not just the pop stuff. It's increasingly, as you're asking, rock music is being mixed entirely in the box. Warren, I often hear you say, if it sounds good, it is good. That sounds pretty straightforward, but what if I have bad taste? <laughs> well, let me tell you, I've told this story a few times before and uh, my wife, if she watches this, will uh, wring her fists at me. But my father-in-law goes on a cruise ship, it's a few years ago, and the crooner guy on the cruise ship has a CD. So my father-in-law buys a copy or takes a copy of the CD and promises the crooner guy that I'm going to review it. Gives it to me and tells me, yes, 
you know, I promised that you would listen to this and give him your honest opinion. <laughs> like, thanks. So I remember we were in my wife's car when we were driving home and I put the CD in like the center section of my wife's car. I didn't go back to the car for a couple of months. Yep, two months. And eventually I'm like driving her car again and I look down to the center section and there it is. There's the CD from the cruise ship crooner. I put it on, I listened to it. I listened to like half a song, quarter of a song, beginning of some songs. And I went through the album, maybe in about five or 10 minutes, skipped through a bunch of songs and then called my father-in-law. And I said, hey, just wanted to let you know I just listened to the, the, the uh, cruise ship singer's CD that you gave me to listen to. And of course he was like, oh, I was wondering when you were gonna do that. I promised him, like, thanks. He says to me, what did you think? And so I said, well, before I tell you what I think, what did you think? And he goes, oh, it was dreadful. At which point I said, I agree, it's terrible. And I said, then why did you give it to me? And he goes, because I'm not a professional and I wanted to hear your opinion. So what's the moral of that story? The moral of that story is we all can hear things. I get a hundred emails a day saying, please review my CD, please review my single, please review my EP, review the latest recording, the mix. And obviously I can't go and do all, all of those. You can book me if you want to do it, but generally speaking, hundreds and hundreds of attachments of MP3s. When somebody does book me and I listen to it, They'll say to me, what did you think? And I will do exactly the same thing. I'll say, what did you think? And they'll say, you know, I felt like the low end was a bit, bit big and the bass was like kind of covering the kick drum and I couldn't hear any definition down there. And it felt like it was over compressed, the whole mix. And they say, well, what, did you, what did you think, Warren? And I said, the same. What happens is, and I went through this, and I probably still have this, the sort of imposter syndrome that we have where we don't trust ourselves. But the reality is if you hear those problems, they're real, especially if you're referencing on different systems which give different, you know, different results, especially if you are comparing against well-recorded, well-mixed material, and that sounds flat in your room, and then you put your mix on and the low end's blowing up. You know what it means? It means the low end's blowing up. You don't need me to tell you that. It's nice to get somebody to pat you on the back and tell you that you're hearing it okay. One of the biggest things is really to learn to trust your ears. Trust your ears. It's a huge thing because we all come into this kind of a little terrified, a little overwhelmed by platinum records and gold and stuff. Well, that's great. But like we were talking about with the mixing thing, a lot of that is barrier to entry. You know, there used to be a tiny echelon of people that got to work in studios and worked on SSLs. So they mixed all the big records. Like we talked about earlier, now the playing field is level and there's so many young up and coming guys and girls that are making incredible records and mixing them. It's not all just that tiny echelon of pop music. There's a lot of other great music. There is guys and girls like you watching that are doing great things. Trust your ears. If you hear a problem, it's a problem. If you want to check it and reference it on other systems, do that. But the sooner you can trust your own judgment, the quicker and better and easier and faster you will learn. So trust your ears. So when you're saying about bad taste, I mean, bad taste is, is, is I know it's a joke that you were making, but you'd have to have bad taste in as much as like, I only like listening to music where the bass is the only thing you can hear. Trust your ears, trust your own judgment, and just go out there and make great music. Do you use songs in the key of life as a reference mix as there's always seems to be a copy hanging around somewhere in the background? Thank you for pointing that out. At the moment, there is two eight track cassettes of uh, songs in the key of life there. There's usually the vinyl up on the console. It looks like it got taken down when we were swapping out the speakers. And just so you know, we do still have the baby E's, the SC205s up there, and we have been working on them we did two rough mixes for Mark Martel that we sent him that were mixed on that. We did, um, last week when we had the Adams up, we did some rough mixes on that as well. There's multiple reasons why I own multiple copies of Songs in the Key of Life. Number one, it's in my top five albums of all time. Some days it's number one, some days it's number two. It's usually uh, Night of the Opera by Queen, of course. But Songs in the Key of Life is right up there for me. It was a life-changing album. 
Having an eight track cassette is reminding me of the fact that my father had it on eight track cassette. And the first time I ever heard that was in the car with him. And Stevie Wonder is an inspiration on all levels. On all levels, he was a huge child star who is not just a kid that could sing in tune. No, this guy can play multiple instruments to the highest level, incredible drummer. If you haven't yet, please, please, please watch The Summer of Soul. The Summer of Soul is an absolute masterpiece. About two months ago when it came out, I did post about it, so many of you may have already seen that post. It's an incredible concert that happened in Harlem over quite a few days in 1969. And this footage is amazing. The performances are incredible. Nina Simone's in it, Stevie Wonder's in it, um, Sly and the Family Stone. I mean, the list is endless. B.B. King, all absolutely incredible. The footage is beautifully restored. The audio is incredible. This footage was done in 1969 and then just sat there and was never officially released until the rather wonderful Mr. Questlove, I'm sure you all know him, famously the drummer of The Roots and also the musical director, and just an insane talent, he got hold of the footage and directed possibly one of my favorite movies on music, at least since the Queen movie, just as important to me. You've got to watch. If you haven't seen it yet, Summer of Soul. Stevie's in that. Stevie would have been just 19 years old. And you see him play drums and he's absolutely phenomenal. What an incredible talent. So I keep it up, keep the album up, purely and utterly for inspiration. I mean, that album has so much depth in songwriting, in performance, in production. It's a masterpiece from start to finish. I believe Elton John called it the greatest album ever made, bar none, something like that. I mean, he basically, not basically, he did say it was the greatest album ever. And I wouldn't really argue with him. Between Songs in the Key of Life and A Night at the Opera, those two albums shaped me more than anything else, except maybe the MJQ. My father used to always play Milt uh, Jackson and, and just like the MJQ, oh, what a band. And of course, the classical music I grew up on. But those two albums, Wow. wow. So go check out Summer of Soul. Thank you ever so much for asking that great question. I don't reference it for mixing. I re reference it for music um, and everything, inspiration. Yeah, the mix is incredible. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. But it's there to inspire me in everything I do. If we can come anywhere close to the greatness that Stevie Wonder had, that would be insane. Um, we do actually have a video on Stevie Wonder. There will be a link down there as well. So check out the Stevie Wonder video. Go watch the Summer of Soul video. And of course, go and check out the rather wonderful, iconic guitars. Great people. Thank you ever so much for watching. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. We'll see you all again very, very soon. So long, farewell, au revoir. There's a couple of giveaways this week with the Cali speakers and the Eve speakers. Don't forget to enter to win a pair of those lovely speakers. Cheerio. Goodbye. Tschüss.